Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bag Lady Show. I am one of your hosts, Shauna. This is my lovely co-host, Rana. Rana and Shauna. Mm-hmm. It rhymes. You were very creative in naming me, weren't you? Well, you know, I can't even remember exactly how that came about. I think I was substitute teaching at the time. And there was a, a girl in my class, and, and it was Shauna, and it was spelled that way. So I went home, and I told your dad, I said, oh, this would be cute. Shauna, you, then you'd have a Rana and a Shauna. And I was just kind of, you know, flippant about it, but he loved it. <laughs> well, and so I, I passed it on to my son. He's <laughs> Sean <laughs> and Shauna. So, you know, whatever. It works. It works. And uh, today... Uh, is the dreaded tax day. Ooh, April 15th. April 15th. Dun, dun, dun. I tell you what, I tell you what, uh, we all live in constant dread of the IRS. Um, <laughs> uh, but let, let's do a little IRS trivia. Okay. okay. They're just doing their job. Okay. They're just doing their job. Oh, well, hey, and for some people, it's not really dreaded because they get money back. <laughs> yeah. So, somebody once told me, um, you know you're poor if you look forward to it. To April 15th. That's me. <laughs> I always look forward to the, it. Get the refund back. <laughs> All right, we're going to have a little trivia questions here. We'll see how you do, Shauna, with the IRS. Okay, play along at home. See mm-hmm. how you do. When was the IRS created? 1862, B, 1904, or C, 1937? A. 18, ah. 18 what? A. 1862. 1862. So uh, we go way back with the IRS. Uh, what is the annual budget of the IRS? Is it A, oh, wow. $750 million, B, $6.4 billion, or C, $11.3 billion? What is your answer? A year? Yes. Of revenue? No, it, to operate the whole department. Oh, my word. The bill, the the biggest billion you said, eleven billion. Wow, eleven three billion, and a lot of those people are auditors. <laughs> <laughs> We've been audited before, uh, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, how many people ask to file an extension each year? Is it A one in ten, B three in ten, or C five in ten? An extension. Five. Five out of ten. Five out of ten. Yeah. Oh. Only one in ten. Only one in ten? And for some reason, huh. and I read this, more women file for extensions than men. I I don't know why. Okay. All right. Um, and this one just kills me because uh, I hate doing this. On average, how many hours do people spend preparing their tax return? Is it A, eight hours, B, 11 hours, or C, 13 hours? Well, my tax return is so easy. I I don't know what other people's is like. I'm going to go with A. Eight hours? Eight hours. Oh. It's 11 hours. 11 hours. And I hate every single minute of the And you use every 11 hours of it. Yes. (laughs) Just getting the stuff together. Um, This one is a little scary. About how many people have their tax returns audited each year? Is it A, one out of 130, B, one out of every 175 people, or C, one out of 220 people? Um, I'm going to say, since you said it was scary, one out of every 30. Well, I, I, I can't, it was one out of every 130. But maybe I said the wrong thing. But oh, it's wrong. But it still seems like one out of every two hundred and twenty. I mean, either any figure is scary to think that you're going to be audited. audited. Even even if you do everything right. I mean, uh, yeah, it's it, like it's like when you're a kid and you get in trouble, but you know you didn't do anything wrong, and yet you're still scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah like I said, we we all live in huge fear of the IRS. Um, now here's some. Cheerio news. Cheerio. What is the average amount of a refund? Oh. A, $1,400. B, 
$2,200 or C, $2,781. Um, well, that was pretty exact. So maybe that's it. I'll say $2,200. Uh, but it's good. It's higher. $2,781. I knew I should have said that because that was quite an that's exact figure. That's a lot of do re -mi. I mean, that's pretty cool if you get a check in the mail from the government, you know, a sure. refund. Sure. Well, since it's tax day, though, uh, maybe a lot of you need cheering up. Let's because do a lot it. of people don't get that refund. <laughs> and uh, so we thought, what better person to cheer us up than uh, one of our favorite people? Yeah. And he's one of America's most popular weatherman. And um, he does so many things for his community. And um, so we're just really happy about uh, sharing his interview with him, uh, with you all. Well, who is it? It's Steve Stucker. I'm Steve sorry, I forgot to tell you. Steve Stucker. Stucker. Come on down. Good old Stevie boy. And you're going to find that even if you know about him, if you live in New Mexico like we do, you're going to learn some oh, you're neat gonna things about him. Oh, you're going to learn a lot. So sit back and enjoy the interview with our favorite weatherman, probably the most popular guy in New Mexico, none other than... Steve Stucker. Well, good morning. We are so very, very happy to have the most popular man in New Mexico <laughs> on our podcast. None Hello. other than Steve Stucker. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thanks. I'm looking around wondering who you're talking about. <laughs> thinking, Wait a minute. I thought I was supposed to be the guest on the show. Oh, today. man. Hey, thank hey. you. It's good to see you too. Hey, listen, uh, we're just thrilled to have you today. And, um, um, you know, we just really, in, in doing these uh, interviews, um, what we've really enjoyed and what our people have enjoyed are the stories. And so I want us to start before we get into all these crazy, insane things you have done. By the way, how do you have this energy to do all these <laughs> I mean, is it B12 shots or what? Yeah. <laughs> My wife would argue that oh, okay. uh, there's none left when I get home. There's none left. Yeah. I bet. Well, I, I just want, I, I want to start out by just um, asking you about even, even your childhood, early influences, uh, maybe some things that nobody even knows about Steve Stucker. And then we'll get oh. into, <laughs> into all the, the things that you have done and, and, and great contributions that you've made. Well, gosh, we're talking ancient history here. That's all um, right. <laughs> you know, I, I was really blessed as, as a child. Um, both of my parents were really involved. They loved their kids. I had three siblings. There were four of us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I think it would embarrass my parents if I said we were poor. Um, we never had two extra nickels to rub together, rub together. as we said in those mm -hmm. days. Um, but we we never went without, we had food and we had a home and we had a car. I mean, it was usually a beat up old car. I remember, I remember for three years, we drove a blue car with a red door uh, yes. because, uh, because awesome. my, my mom's sister borrowed it for a date. And um, I don't know the story, but the door was open and they were backing down an alley and hit a telephone pole. And the door. Oh, that was quite some date. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, um, that's that's what we needed to get by. And I mean, if we ever uh, ever got a vacation, it was typically a, a short camping trip at a nearby mm -hmm. state park. And, uh, you know, I as, as I got older, I would joke, they'd say, where are you going for a vacation? And I would say, well, I don't know. It depends where the car breaks down. I mean, we came home. <laughs> We, we came home on the wrong end of a tow rope uh, many, many times. Aww. But but you know I have um, I have beautiful memories of of my childhood. Uh, my my folks did their best. They were both originally high school dropouts who went mm -hmm. back, and my my dad got a a, a technical ed education and became a, a, a heating and air conditioning person. My mom. Uh, went back and got her high school diploma and then went on and did some college. But it was it was tough growing up. My dad was a hard worker, but he had a lot of physical issues. I remember mm. three major back surgeries mm. when I was a little kid. And back in those days, when it was something with a disc, 
you were flat on your back for six months oh, at a time. Yeah. And there was no unemployment. Uh, there was no government mm. help. And, uh, you know, my mom was a waitress at a truck stop for 25 mm. cents an hour plus tips. Wow. And, uh, but we got by. And not only that, um, my folks, I guess, set the standard for showing me how to jump in and help other people, even mm. when they never had much for themselves. Maybe the best example is, um, you know, my dad was always working two jobs when he was able to work. And uh, I, I, I love sports. My dad was, was real involved in uh, playing men's softball at the time when he had spare time, but he never really had the time to, to coach me. When I got old enough to go out for baseball, I was so excited and I went and uh, I was so terrible that I never got in a single play in the entire season. Not, oh, wow. not, one, not one play in the field, not one at bat. And I used to stand on the corner waiting for my coach to, to drive by to pick me up for practice. And sometimes he'd look the other way and pretend like I wasn't there. I'd be running down the street, Mr. Barford. Mr. Oh, Barford. Oh. And, and it broke my dad's heart. And, yes. um, and, and, and the next year, he um, he got involved with me and he practiced with me and I went out for a for a team and 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 made it as a as a starter and uh, was so excited and just before the season started I came home in tears because the high school kids who are our coaches didn't realize there was a a registration fee of a couple of hundred dollars and this was when my dad was probably making forty bucks an hour and we oh. went home thinking that the team was going to be disbanded. My folks didn't have the money to pay for it, but they went to work and they found a, a friend who had a little band and they put together like a, a banquet and they sold tickets and they oh. got prizes. And they not only paid our entry fee, but had enough to get our uniforms and equipment. And, and, oh. and, and, and so, you know, that that's just one example that, that my parents um, yes. gave me that just really showed me. They never talked about it. They just did it. Mm. And they coached and they did scouts and they were real involved with um, with church and uh, making sure that somehow we got to summer camps. You know, I had to go sell uh, candy door to door for the YMCA to go to summer camp, but I got to go. Mm. And uh, yes. so I, I really had a, a good childhood. I got in trouble a lot. But it, oh, <laughs> imagine that it was OK. It was it was a, it was a good way to grow up. And honestly, I don't think I ever knew that we didn't have much until um, until I, you know, grew up and, 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 and moved away and look, look back at how how it was and what they must have gone through. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and in America, the standards of of are so different, too, than other places. So here, even growing up. Um, with little is still a lot more than a lot of the things that we have seen in our lifetime. And it mm -hmm. makes you very humble. And it makes you realize mm -hmm. you had, it sounds like you had such a rich re relationship with your family, your mm -hmm. parents, your sib. That's, that's the most important part. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And it was, it was so much fun. I mean, there was always something crazy going on and the world <laughs> was so different back then, yes. you know, I mean, if you had two cars in your family, <gasps> it was just crazy. And, and now I have, you know, older daughters that live with us and we have five, six cars in the driveway. And, <laughs> and that causes so much trouble. <laughs> so yeah. many leaks. Oh, and yeah, all I do, all I do is shuttle cars. I always remember the time, uh, you know, we took, um, we, they, before seatbelts, oh, we yeah. piled the whole baseball team in the, in the station wagon, set the seats down and piled everybody in the back. 17 people and we were proud of it <laughs> we were proud of it and we got to the ballpark and realized that we left my little brother rusty home alone on the stoop. <laughs> oh man so it was all it was always an adventure and when oh, i'm yes. able to get together with my with with my siblings my mom is still alive my dad has passed has passed on but there's always lots of fun stories from growing oh, up and awesome. uh it, it, it really it really was a blessing but i think um any community involvement that I have now, those seeds were probably planted back then. Yes, and that's what's beautiful is, in, and that's why we love hearing these stories and your story because we we had a hunch somehow your your parents or someone in your life 
uh, got you into all of this community service that you do. So after you grew up, and did you go on to college or? Uh, yeah, you know, um, I, I was the first um, member of my family to graduate from high school. And I wow. don't think my parents told me that ahead of time because they didn't want to jinx it. <laughs> and um, they, they, they kept telling me that I should go to college. And I really didn't understand why. Mm -hmm. um, I was just a total sports nut as a kid. That's all I really cared about. I didn't really pay much attention in school other than the social type. <laughs> thing. Um, but I, you know, I, 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 I always thought that I'd be able to go and play in college. And um, I um, ended up uh, at, a, at a small school in Northwest Missouri that has since won uh, six or seven national championships, mm. but they, um, they, they weren't quite that well known back then. It was <laughs> Northwest Missouri State University. And I, I, I didn't make the team. I went down and I tried out. I was an all-conference football player in, in, my, uh, in my high school days in Omaha in Council Bluffs, Iowa, Omaha, Nebraska, but uh, went, went down and um, got hurt right away. Mm. And um, um, continued through the first semester of college, kind of a lost person, not kind of, very lost. I, mm. I'd always identified as being a, a jock or an athlete. Mm. And um, when I wasn't able to do that, I, I was, I guess, looking back, I guess I was kind of searching for my identity. Identity. And uh, I just became a, a, a party person, I guess, you know, and uh, that, that led to... Uh, Steve, uh, a lot of trouble. Steve, um, I'm going to raise my hand and we're going to start over there. We've lost you on the screen. Yeah, I see that my uh, <laughs> battery just just went okay. Dead. Okay, no problem. I should have checked that beforehand. I am plugged in now, so hopefully no problem. So, so, go, so pick it back up with uh, you were you were kind of a lost soul and then got into the party scene. Yeah, you know, um, freshman year in college. Um, I, I had, uh, my first semester paid for, I didn't know what I was there for except to play football. And when that disappeared, I, I just kind of slipped into the party scene and it wasn't totally new to me. I had really, you know, started to slip, uh, quite a bit in high school, but in college with, you know, no, no visible reason in my simple way of thinking for not doing it other than getting up and going to class. Um, I just, you started kind of a kind of a long slide, and it was an interesting mix because I was a worker. I paid my way through school, um, and I, you know, I attended class, and somehow I got decent grades. But the partying took more and more of my time and 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 more of my interest. It was in um, college that I got involved in broadcasting. Hmm. Uh, I look back on it now and really see God's hand in it though I was um, far away from God at the time, you know, I was raised in the church, was very involved mm -hmm. until I was maybe about 10 years old, between somewhere 12, 13 in middle school, I just ran away from the church. I just rejected it completely. And uh, I knew right from wrong, but I just decided I didn't want to, didn't want to mess with that, didn't want to have anything to do with it. And is as so many um, college age people do, uh, just just wanted to find out what life was really all about, and mm -hmm. you know, explored all the all, all all the different things that I could get my hands on, and um, just just really really came up empty every time. But I got started in broadcasting through my university. Uh, you guys will love this story. It was at the very end of the semester. I knew I was going to be out of money, and I was going to have to drop out at Christmas. And uh, one of my friends from the dormitory came by and he said, Steve, I'm going to be on the radio. And I said, what do, you, what do you mean? He says, well, we have a campus radio station and I've been taking classes. I'm on the extra crew and they just called me somebody's sick and I'm going to be a, a, a disc jockey tonight. Wow. Well, I've been there the whole semester. I didn't even know we had a campus radio. <laughs> and we... And so we thought it was really cool because our buddy, buddy Joe was on and we tuned in and listened. And... Uh, Oh my gosh, he was terrible. <laughs> and we we sat there both uh, you know, both fascinated and cracking up at the same time. Every time he turned the radio, he'd go, 
And this is Smooth Joe Alpo on the radio. Oh, boy. And we would, we would just crack up. But at the same time, it was so cool because it was our friend. And the next morning, I tuned into the station again. And I heard a guy reading the news. And he was struggling reading. Um, he was, you know, uh, mispronouncing a lot of words and repeating himself and losing his place. And at the end of the newscast, he gave his name and boom, it was another friend of mine. <laughs> and I said, I think I have found my new career. I could read. So maybe I could do the news. And, you know, I, I, I left um, to go back home and to work in a factory to save my money to come back to college. But it was that uh, encounter that experience that sort of lit the fuse for for me to get enthused about something and to give me a reason to go back to college. Wow. I worked in a, a chemical factory and um, made made enough money to go back to school the next year, intent upon getting involved in broadcasting. And then I got there, and I was I was too shy, I was too embarrassed to go get involved. And I found a group see? of. Um, juniors and seniors who were involved in the broadcasting program and I'd sit with them at lunch and I'd pepper them with questions and and you know and after about a month one of them said Stucker we've told you everything there is to know about coming and getting involved either come to the meetings or just shut up and go talk. <laughs> yeah it really embarrassed me and I, I went to the meeting and and got involved and was you know I've been involved in broadcasting for for almost 40 years since then. Wow. So from that, so from that college experience, fast forward then to, to KOB. Well, uh, in between, I was, a I was a top 40 rock and roll DJ for, uh, for about almost 15 years. I didn't know um, that. Okay. And I worked, uh, start started there in, in, in Missouri and, and worked in my, uh, in my hometown in Omaha and, uh, went to Amarillo. And, um, you know, it was over that period of time as I started to see success in my career mm -hmm. that my, my, my situation with my personal life really um, deteriorated. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I, I was drinking more and more. Um, I became a pothead. And, you know, this time in my life, it's, it's really embarrassing. And I, and, and, and I hate I hate that, but I, I've seen that, that God has taken my trash and, and turned it into treasure wow. and uh, yeah. took me somebody that rejected him and knew better and um, destroyed uh, a lot of my brain cells mm. and, and wasted a lot of my opportunity and ability over, over a period of about 10 or 15 years and um, took me back when I, you know, when I, when I, when I came back to church. Uh, in my in my thirties, um, I, uh, I I work in a variety of places. I, I was in Amarillo, Texas. And then I came out to Santa Fe and um, started uh, working for a company that built a new radio station here that really took off, which just uh, exacerbated my problems. And again, it was like in college. I was a good worker. I was a good employee. I wasn't on the streets as a as 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 a person that was homeless. But um, my issues with alcohol and drugs were just taking over. And it was, it was seriously an addiction, both physically and psychologically. Mm -hmm. You know, I catch a lot of grief these days because I don't chuckle and laugh and make light of um, the use of, of marijuana, like it's some harmless substance, mm -hmm. uh, like, like people want to wanna push these days. I all the time have people tell me it's not addicting and it's like, well, what did I live through then? What, what was it that took me four and a half, five years of serious trying and pain and misery to quit? What was the physical and the psychological effects that I was struggling with simultaneously? Well, I knew I needed to get away from this and, and, and also the, uh, the depression, the listlessness and, um, that, that that came with it. So while I was um, seeming to have you know pretty good success in my chosen industry, um, inside I was just digging a deeper and deeper hole. Got married, had um, had a child, a son, and um, you know 
my my marriage blew up and I have to take 85 or 90 percent of the blame, maybe more. Um, I hurt a lot of the people that I knew that loved me the most. I really didn't uh, pay much attention to my parents who had been so wonderful to me. I I hurt them terribly and I hurt a lot of people along the way through my selfishness. And that's, um, you know, I, I, I guess you could say it's a burden I, I, I have to bear. I, I know that I've been forgiven and uh, I cherish that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I'm always hesitant to bring it up because it's, you know, it's an embarrassment to me. But at the same time, I, I can see very clearly now over my past 10 years as a pastor, especially, but even before that, that God was able to take those experiences and use them to help me relate to the young men in jail that I used to go minister to in the youth detention facilities and um, other people. Um, and, 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 and to this day, I have a real heart for people that are struggling mm-hmm. with those, those same kinds of issues. And uh, it gives me a little bit of insight that some of my colleagues who I really admire who've never gone through those dark times, uh, can't, can't pull from the experience from, you know, God doesn't waste anything, you know? Yeah. It's really great. It's It's really great. Isn't it great how he uses not our strengths, but what he uses our weaknesses. Yeah. And our strength. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I was, I was doing the radio thing and, um, oh my gosh, I went through a period uh, that was really, uh, really difficult. I lost or was chased out of, uh, three jobs in about four years and, um, ended up, um, divorced, a single dad. Um, my, my son's mother and I, my, my, my ex-wife agreed to, to come back to New Mexico and that we would, um, co-parent him here as, as divorced parents until he graduated from high school, came back and um, took a a pretty good radio job. Uh, It only lasted a little over a year and I was underemployed for a couple of years, just hanging out, kind of not really, not even close to doing what I wanted to do, um, but committed to staying here because, because of my son. And, you know, that was one of the great things. Um, before I became a believer, I look back now and I can see the Lord using my son to help me realize how messed up I was and how much I needed to change. There's uh, one instance that I'll never forget. I, I had mentioned that I was such a pothead and my son was probably barely three one time and we're at the house and he's imitating daddy and goes, daddy, daddy, look. And he grabs his fingers like he's smoking a roach and he pretends like he's inhaling. And it was like a knife through my chest. I was like, you know, my dad grew up in an alcoholic family, struggled to avoid that. And I just dove into the, to the garbage myself. And here I was showing my little boy who I love with all my heart that that kind of of stuff was okay and so I, I i knew at that point i had to change still uh <laughs> it wasn't easy and it wasn't immediate it took me a long time a lot of struggle but god used my son and uh so i struggled through a couple years here in albuquerque doing uh, sales for radio stations and then um got on at uh at channel four as an occasional employee <laughs> uh, <laughs> meaning that when they were really really hard up and desperate <laughs> they'd call me in the middle of the night once every six eight weeks and i'd jump up and run in and fill in on the morning show and um after a couple of months uh, sort of talked my way into a, a full-time position that came open and that was 31 32 years ago Wow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, uh, incredible. And, 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 and I love the humility of your story, even though th- I, we all have those times that we're not proud of and it shows just what you've come through and to be such a, a big figure on the news and in different areas to be humble like that and to share that is amazing. And I remember the first time I did get mom down in Albuquerque um, you and I were up there 
I think that on the roof, 68 <laughs> mile an hour winds that it's year. It was awful. insane. And you got up there and you, you were just on fire with me and motivated me to keep going. And I remember I got a lot of um, negative comments like, oh, she's just doing it for attention. Oh, all these different things. And, and that was the first time it struck me like, oh my gosh, people are really mean and cruel, even when you're doing kind things. Do you run across that a lot? Have you run across that a lot in your years of the TV industry? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. And, um, you know, the world is getting crazier by the moment. And there are people out there, especially with social media, yes. um, that just get a big kick out of popping your balloon yeah. uh, or, or, you know, shutting you down or criticizing you, especially when it's a, a faith-based cause. And, you know, um, I, I wish I could say it doesn't bother me. I'm too much of a, a people pleaser. I want everybody to be happy and that's impossible. Yes. Um, um, but you know, we just, we, we, we just have to have faith in, 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 in what we're doing and, and, and recognize that we don't know all the time what's behind the negativity. Sometimes some, somebody's just mean, sometimes they don't even realize how they're coming across, but, but there's a lot of times when there's something else behind it. Right. And, uh, you know, I've probably spent too much time on it, but there are individuals out there who've been very, very critical of me through emails or phone calls or whatever, that I have taken the time to try and develop a relationship with. Wow. And quite a few times, quite a few times, I've been able to turn it around, whether that's a, a great use of my limited time or not. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. But, you know, we just we just have to, to, to recognize that not everybody's going to agree with us. Mm -hmm. And if we're called to do something, particularly when it's something selfless, like, oh my gosh, you said being on fire on the roof, well, I needed a fire to keep from freezing to death. Oh, was I was the coldest. Cold. I think that might have been the cold. coldest I've ever been. And I grew up in the Midwest where it's, <laughs> where it's horrible. But, you know, um, I, I, I think that a big part of it is recognizing what we're called to. I had just become a born again believer when I got the job offer at Channel 4. And a, a, a big part of me coming to faith was um, apologizing to myself, asking, asking the Lord to be forgiven, and really setting my mind on, on living a life that was right. And I struggled through a period when I was underemployed being dissatisfied. And I, I finally came to the point of recognizing how sinful that was and, mm -hmm. and going, going to the Lord and, and, and asking him to forgive me for that because I was feeding my son and I was housed and I was clothed and it, I was okay. I just wasn't doing what I wanted to do. And I, I promised the Lord that if this is what you want me to do, I'll be satisfied with it. And it was only about three weeks later that this job offer at Channel 4 came up. And I was real hesitant to take it because I didn't want to go back on what I had just promised God. And so I really, really prayed about it. And after a couple of days, I just, I just felt this um, small, still voice saying, if you can do this right, I can use it. Wow. And I really didn't know what that meant. But... I, I figured that it meant I was okay to give it a try, that I just needed to be careful. But I, I really had trouble even my wildest imagination beginning to imagine how, how God's going to use, um, you know, a morning weather guy that's on in the middle of the night <laughs> for, 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 for his purposes. But it really, it really didn't take long at all. Um, one, one quick example I'll give you is I started within a month or so putting silly little phrases up on the chart. Like uh, today, today was a uh, convenience store clerk day. Right. And uh, you know, it's like, wear your shorts and winter day or whatever, just goofy little phrases. And I, I noticed one day that it was um, national adoption month. And I thought, well, that's kind of boring. So I changed it a little bit. And I, I, I put the phrase for um, the day consider adoption month. And I would just 
briefly mentioned, there's a lot of kids available for adoption in New Mexico. Uh, check with CYFD. If you're interested, please consider adopting these kids. Well, that afternoon, I got a call from a lady at the station and she was in tears. And she said, um, I just want to tell you that I was walking through the room today and um, something amazing happened. She said, I've been married for about 10 or 12 years. I have three little kids. I've been in a horribly abusive relationship. And she said, uh, about two months ago, my husband almost beat me to death and I had to take my kids and run away and hide and we're never going back. She said, um, just last week, I found out I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. She said, and I was devastated because I can't even support the kids that I have now, let alone bring another one into the world. And she said, the only thing I could think of doing was having an abortion. She said, I was walking into the room to make the phone call. She said, and I saw that little phrase on the map that said, consider adoption. She mm -hmm. said, and I hit my knees and I started bawling. She said, I called, I'm going to have this baby. I'm going to put it up for adoption. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted you to know. And I was, I was totally blown away. Mm -hmm. I wasn't campaigning or preaching. I was just having fun and trying to do my job, but God used it in a way. And, and that was encouragement that, that he could use my little job in other ways too. And, and you know, you've really used what I would call, I don't know, weather entertainment, uh, bringing the dogs on and, uh, you know, going out to the balloon fiesta. I mean, you are just everywhere doing all kinds of fun stuff. But at the same time, it's, it's how you serve. I mean, you, I mean, I don't know, I don't know that there's anybody that I've ever known that was more involved in community service uh, th than you. It's, it, it's amazing. And, uh, and you never, you know, what I always love too, is if you can do it, you will, even though your, your schedule is packed, you, you don't tell even people like the bag ladies know, <laughs> and, um, and you're just everywhere. Uh, just, just spreading love and compassion and involvement. How important is that for people to, to grab hold of, of how important it is to give back and to serve others? Well, well you know, um, early on in my broadcasting career, before I was a believer, before I followed Jesus, I recognized the value of community service. And like I said, some of it was kind of implanted in me, in my family. Yeah. And it was a recognition that, you know, I'm not that great a broadcaster. I need something else here. I need a, a little gimmick or something extra. And I, 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 I found out that, you know, if you show up at people's events and help them trumpet the good things that they're doing, that there's some, some recognition and some gratitude. And so it helped helped me build names in a couple of the communities where I was. And here in New Mexico, the people have been so incredibly good to me from, you know, the Native Americans up, but you know, you guys are up there in the right. four corners and you know, what a, what a wonderful community they have there uh, to, you know, just everybody. And, and so, you know, I, I don't normally join boards um, I, I'm not really a, a, a joiner in, in organizations and things like that, but what I've tried to do is just shine the spotlight on the good things that other people are doing. And if there's a way for me to get out for a day or a couple of days and, and do something to help out so much the better, because that really gives me a lot more understanding about what they're doing and what the need is and helps me to really get to know the people that are involved in the people that they're serving. And so that, that enriches me personally mm -hmm. too. So it was, you know, it, it really kind of started as, um, as a business kind of a thing, just trying to build my name up, but it's something that I really, really love now and just really cherish like the, the blood drive stuff. I'm, I'm up around, I don't know, 15, 16 gallons that I've donated <laughs> a pint at a time. And I was, ter I was terrified of that to start with. But, you know, yeah. once I did it and, and realized that it's easy and it's important, and then you meet a couple of people who've, who've received blood transfusions or their family members have, and it, and, and it becomes something to get involved in. I mean, that's just like with you guys. I mean, gosh, with you know, the things that you were doing back then, the things that you're doing now, I always 
watch from from afar and we only touch base every once in a while but i'm enriched by by knowing about what you do and and by you know just being a little teeny tiny part of it every now and then and, and helping to promote it so that's i think that's where that comes from yeah awesome. and, and thank you and and so can you tell our listeners the things that you are, the things that you are doing, the the beds for kids. Um, tell us about some of your projects. Yeah, well, the big thing, the all encompassing, <laughs> life changing thing is uh, beds for kids, mm-hmm. and um, kind of an interesting story. Um, my my pastor Dave Rao uh, invited me to go on a motorcycle trip with him up to Red River. He said I have to talk to the Chamber of Commerce about a concert that we want to do. And uh, why don't you ride along? I had just gotten a new Harley Davidson. And so we, mm-hmm. we went up for the weekend and, and we met with the folks. And I just, just kind of sat there. I didn't really have much to do with it. The next week, the um, chamber president from Red River called and he said, you know, Steve, we have this, this big event in, um, around Memorial Day and we've never had a signature ride with it, would you like to do it? Well, I didn't even know what a signature ride was. So I, I had to, you know, be the dummy and ask. He goes, well, you know, you put your name on a ride, you you set it up and you sell sponsorships and you give the money to whatever charity you want. Cool. Well, I thought that sounded like fun and uh, said, sure, I do it. Hooking the mouth like a big fish, <laughs> not having any clue how much work it was or anything, Uh-oh. but you know, the first year we, we stumbled around and put it together and we cleared about $5,000 and we donated it to Make-A-Wish, Lo- lovely, wonderful organization. Yeah. And the next year we did it again. And um, we did that for several years and people came to me and said, well, Steve, you know, this money is going to go on your income tax. If you don't form a nonprofit, mm-hmm. you better take care of that. So you're, you're good with the IRS, even though we'd never taken a penny. So we started that process and it was long and involved. You guys know how that is oh, yeah. yes. going, going through the IRS and it, it's expensive, but we put together a little board of directors and we donated over the years. So I think through four years, I think we donated about almost $50,000 to make a wish through my little event. And we were keeping a little tiny bit of the money to do the jail ministry that I was involved in. So when the young men got released, we could help them buy uniforms for their job, help them to get their cars repaired, uh, helping them to get tools and stuff like that. And we'd use it to buy Bibles and the other materials that that we had for the teachings that we were doing. And um, I got a a Facebook message, uh, unexpected private message saying, my niece is 12 and has spina bifida so severely she can't get up and down into a regular bed. She's been sleeping on the couch for two years and it's literally killing her. Can you get her a hospital bed? Well, being the kind and caring Christian man that I am, my response was, well, no. <laughs> Who do you think I am? A hospital bed? Well, well I was not expecting that. <laughs> that answer. <laughs> I mean, I would, I'm just being honest. That yeah, was just no, right. Steve, Steve popping out. I'm like, a total stranger asking me for something so absurd. And I got up without replying and just walked away, just upset. Yeah. But I, I, you know, a couple hours later, I look back on it now and it must have been like, like uh, God just tapped me on the shoulder and said, You could ask, you know, that ask and you shall receive thing. And I, I went online and I said, yeah. I know this sounds weird, but does anybody have a hospital bed? There's this yeah. little girl. She's got spina bifida and she's really sick. And if you have one, let me know. Well, within an hour, I had the hospital bed and God connected the dots for the first time. And he's done it 10,000 times since then. The lady who had the hospital bed was the secretary of my board of directors. Her, Her father had spent the last four or five years of his life in that bed at home. He'd been gone about four or five years. She'd been bugging her mom to find a home for it, but it still had sentimental value to mom mm-hmm. until she found out this little girl needed it. So she said, it's yours. And I thought, well, that's great. I went back and found the, uh, found the message and I read the small print and it said, we live in Shiprock. And I'm thinking, oh, great. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> and, and only then, only then did it hit me. I know nothing about 
taking a hospital bed apart or putting it together. I had no idea what was involved. I went back online and my Facebook audience, a guy that was a medical equipment salesperson said, oh, it's easy. I'll do it. My friend and I will even take it up there and put it together for you. Mm -hmm. So they went up to Shiprock, took pictures of little Dakota, who was 12, almost 13 at the time. Her and her mom sitting on the bed, thumbs up and just wow. ear to ear grins. And it was so sweet. So we posted the pictures on, on my Facebook page and I told everybody, thank you. And I went to bed thinking, Man, that's, that's kind of interesting. Next subject, you know, and yeah. the next morning, my um, box was probably had six, eight messages. Hey, I need a bed. I heard you're giving people beds. Can you help me with a bed? <laughs> and I thought, are you serious? <laughs> and and so I started, man. I started trying to connect people that, you know, well, with somebody else is asking for a bed and I didn't know the difference between a twin and a king and <laughs> anything. And, and I was, um, you know, connecting people uh, behind the scenes. And my wife, who's always the reasonable one said, don't you ever read those stories about Craigslist? You're going to send a murderer to someone's house and it's going to be your fault. And I thought, gee, you know, she's probably right. So my response was, you know, well, why don't you drop it off here when my wife's at work and we'll just stick it in my garage. And the next thing I know, my, my three car garage is filled with other people's beds and Rose is seriously considering divorce. And that's when, that's when we sort of realized that there was really something to this. So I went online, I uh, found a, a company that volunteered some storage space for a while and we started off and, um, the first, full year of doing it, we put um, 500 people in beds. Mm -hmm. The second year we did a thousand. And right now, ever since then, we've been moving along at about 2,400 to 2,600 people every year. And we're just about to uh, reach the 11,000 people placed oh mark goodness. through beds for kids. And ladies, it has been such a beautiful ministry. Yes. Um, oh my gosh. We, we pray with the families. We try to follow up. And while we limit ourselves to strictly beds and related items like, you know, pillows and blankets and linens and dresser drawers, um, we work with other ministries. We do our best to follow up to try and get them involved in our ministry or to attend um, Bible studies, to get involved in churches. And uh, gosh, it's uh, the whole gamut from families who've had tragedies like the, the very first one Dakota who is now 19 and in college and just just doing great as a matter of fact we just got her a new bible about a month ago and uh she's uh she's a new believer who's who's really uh really on fire um but uh single parents uh a lot of grandparents who unexpectedly end up with kids mm -hmm. we do tons with CYFD both sides of the equation for them from the families who are fostering kids to those who've lost their kids, but are doing the hard work to get their kids back and um, just everything, everything in between. And it's just, it's been such a blessing. And like I say, um, God, it just endlessly cracks me up uh, <laughs> connecting the dots. He's, he's paid for every penny of it. It's um, you know, it's a big expense. We, we do almost all volunteers. I, I volunteer, my wife volunteers, all the board members are volunteers. We have two part-time employees and um, they, you know, don't, don't make much at all, but it still costs us about $60,000 just to keep the doors open. Mm -hmm. But um, we, you know, we do that. And in, in, in addition to that, we spent about another $60,000 on purchasing beds last year, mm -hmm. along with the beds that we get donated. So it's just, wow. you know, just one of those beautiful things where God has provided and we just, we just try to stay out of the way yeah. and uh, watch what happens. And it's really, really been fun to see it happen. It's so beautiful and such an organic story of, of you just show up and you become the vessel. <laughs> And things happen, man. And you're shaking and baking and having fun. And I think that's beautiful. We we saw that same need in Africa for our grannies. You know, that they're sleeping on the floor. And so we have like a little um, mattresses for grannies type mm -hmm. of thing. And we know how important it is, I mean, to get a good night's sleep. Oh, 
something we take for granted. We take, we it, take for it, granted. it for granted. We you do. Know, and I'm, I'm, I'm stunned that there's so much need, and that's here in America. That's right. But, but I, I can't even imagine, you know, and with all the, the houses that the, the you folks have put together that have turned into churches, I mean, uh, it's got to be very similar to the same feeling yeah, you, uh, of hard, having a hard time believing how, how, how God has worked, right? It really, you know, it really is. You start out, you know, we started out with just taking a team of volunteers 20 years ago uh, to Kenya. And, and from there, you know, we've just seen God do so many incredible things from working with kids from the slums to building homes uh, to helping schools, medical clinics churches, uh, women in crisis. Uh, and, and you do, you just take that first small step of faith and, and, and God just puts it in your lap. And the thing of it is, if you say no, he'll, he'll give somebody else that blessing. And we, we're always so much more blessed. Our teams are blessed. You're blessed more than the people that, that receive the best. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know, um, I, I don't want anybody to misunderstand the term, but I, I call it getting my hands dirty yeah. and, and, and it's just not being afraid to do the work. You know, a lot of times as a pastor or as a ministry leader, you may feel that you're, you're above doing certain things, but I, I just, I just never have. And gosh, the first year, year and a half, it was just me and whoever I could scrounge up. I borrowed the church's beat up old pickup truck and eventually borrowed a trailer and, and just did it until um, you know we got we got other people involved, and it's hard. A bed, if you think about it, you know when people donate their beds, you have to make the appointment. You got to go pick it up. There's three to five pieces for each bed. You got to load it in the truck, and then from the truck you got to unload it. Then you got to put it in inventory, and then you've got to contact the families that apply for the beds and see what they have room for, and match that up with what you have or don't have in stock and then set the appointments and then load those same five pieces for each bed <laughs> into somebody's truck or take it to their apartment. And it's a lot of work. Yes, it is. But, but you're right. You're exactly right. It's, it's a blessing. And um, I, I just think that too many believers, especially in America, are caught up in just thinking that, well, I just send some money to a ministry yeah. or, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to pray. And both those things are wonderful things. And our, our ministries, yours, mine would not survive without those two things. Right. But I, I, I know you too well enough to know that from, you know, camping out in the middle of winter on top of a roof uh, to, to, to whatever it takes that, and, and, and I can't even imagine the stories you've got about your excursions to, uh, to Africa and some of the situations that you've seen and dealt with. But again, we're richer for the experience. And I really think that that, that helps us to um, have more of a, of, of a sincere and faithful walk with the Lord. You know, I, I just want to uh, kind of <clears throat> wrap things up here. Um, but talking about getting your, your hands dirty, who, who is our example? Jesus Christ. He washed yeah. our feet. You know, feet are nasty. Yeah. And uh, they're dirty. And, and in his day and time, you know, the, the dusty roads of, uh, of, of the Middle East that, that he walked. And, and that's our example. And, um, and, and so it's not easy. I, I, I tell people, listen, I'm not going to sugarcoat mission work. It is very, very difficult. But I wouldn't give for what God has given back to me through people and through the experience. And I know you, you feel the very, very same way. And um, I just want to say, again, you are an inspiration. Uh, you're, you're very popular. You could sit by your pool. I know you do some. I, I see <laughs> pictures on Facebook. That's okay. At least you're not in a Speedo. <laughs> Thank the Lord but, for small favors. Right? That's right. But but uh, but man, you're you're out there losing your life, and in so doing, you're finding it, and and that's the message that we have for people. It's not easy to be to get your 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 hands dirty and to be in with uh, people who have real 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 serious needs. Uh, but what a blessing, and our example of of Christ who who gave his life 
for the underdog, for the outcast, for the widow, for the child who has spina bifida, um, for on and on we go, the drug addict, uh, and, and the, the woman who is trying to raise children on, on a limited income, on and on we go. That's who we're here for. That's who we're here to serve. And, and you have taught us that in such a beautiful way. Um, thank Steve, you where so can, much. Where can the listeners go to find out more about the mattress? The mattress? Yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the program is called Beds for Kids, and it's a weird spelling. It's B E D S, the number four, like the station I work at, and then kids with a Z. So it's bedsforkids.org. We have a website that will tell you, uh, you know, a lot about who we are and what we do. Uh, people can apply for beds there and they can donate beds or financial support there. And by the way, we do have a branch in the Four Corners, too. Um, so, um, you know, we we are always looking for people to um, to get involved. And uh, yeah, just just like you said, it's it's a blessing and uh, I wouldn't trade it. There's always new things going on. We've started to help people with vehicles uh, because a lot of families need transportation to get to work and to school. And um, it's, it's just, uh, it's endless and it's tiring, but uh, you know, what's the old saying better to, to wear out than to rust out. And <laughs> I like um, you that. know, I'm, I'm getting to the point in my life where I'm, you know, I'm looking at, at retiring from the TV station sometime in the near future. Who knows? Maybe they'll make that decision for me uh, sooner than I, than I expect. But um, you know, I I hope that 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 the Lord gives me many more years to work in ministry because I, I love being a pastor and I just I just love um, doing this kind of ministry and the other things that that God has blessed me with. And so um, look forward to that. And I want to wish you and uh, and yours uh, the the best in, in in what you're doing because you guys have just always been. Same kind of a thing, organic, not a big national organization. You're just uh, counting on the Lord to guide and provide. And man, has he done it in your ministry. A couple of bag ladies. Who yeah, well, and, and by the way, by the way, uh, we're, we're selling bags uh, mainly to women. You know, women like bags. Oh, yeah. bags. And so uh, bags for a cause. Any, uh, any of the bags that are sold today, uh, we're going to give uh, some of the proceeds to Beds for Kids. And um uh, again, Steve, what an inspiration. Uh, Sean has got three quick questions for you. Well, sure. Steve, you are crushing this compassion thing. We'd like to know what's your favorite book? Oh, my gosh. Oh, well, the Bible. Yes. <laughs> I mean, if I was on a desert <laughs> island, that, that would be the one thing I would, I would hope that I would be able to have. Gosh, I don't know. Um, there, are, there are so many, and it would change from time to time. Bonhoeffer by Eric Metaxas was, mm-hmm. was just amazing. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I just read a book uh, on, on Abraham Lincoln, and I think it was called A, a, a Cabinet of Rivals. Um, just, you know, I, I, I don't know that I have an all-time favorite, but uh, I try to read whenever I can stay awake long enough to do so. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's good. And then w- would you say you're um, salty or sweet? eater Ooh, combination i yeah. mean oh boy Green there's jelly. nothing like peanut butter and jelly sandwich with yeah. salty potato chips you know yes yes, <laughs> yes i uh, agree i agree and what was your first vehicle oh my gosh my first vehicle was a beat up 57 chevy that didn't run i had to tow it home and it was dark <laughs> army green with a white racing stripe about this wide down the middle oh, oh too cool a- what a piece of junk. <laughs> <laughs> and my little brother, it was a stick and I didn't know how to drive a stick. And I oh, took yeah. my mom and my little brother for a ride. And I said, what do you think? And he goes, well, it's a nice car, but it sure jerks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, fun. Well, Steve, uh, it's been just uh, a enriching, enriching hour for us. Thanks with for you your and humility our... and your openness and sharing your story. Yeah, very cool. Awesome. And uh, we're going to uh, pray that God gives you many more years of uh, being in New Mexico, serving him, helping people. And uh, we just really want you to know what an encouragement you yes, are. Yes, and if I if I see you on the street and I hit you over the head with my bag, it's just because I'm excited to see you. <laughs> as, as you being <laughs> on the show, it's nothing personal. 
<laughs> ladies, you too, you're, you're an inspiration and uh, the humility doesn't come natural. God beats it into me and so did my wife and three dogs. Oh, amen. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Hey, Thanks. listen, we'll be in touch and God bless you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you and having you on the show again. Thank you both. God bless you both. Thank Beautiful you. day. Steve Zucker is so much fun. Uh, I just loved uh, his interview. And I love, love, love his community involvement. You wow. know, what an example to all of us about getting involved in your community. This guy, you know, the beds for kids and and helping families and on and on and on uh, we can go. And he's helped our organization with uh, fundraising events. So, so great guy. Oh, amazing. And what I really admire is his rawness to share the moments mm -hmm. in life where he wasn't the man that he wanted to be. Cause we all have those moments That's in right. life. We've all gone through that and his vulnerability and rawness if not, Oh, I've got to look good. I'm the weatherman. I've got to make it look like mm -hmm. I have it all together. No, he's sharing his heart. Yeah. Very transparent. Yeah. It was really neat. Really, yeah. really neat interview. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our, our, about our handbags and, but mostly we want to talk about what the handbags do. And that is they fund projects primarily for women uh, in the United States, as well as around the world who are hurting, who need our help. We do water projects. We help women with housing and uh, economic education. So many, many things that these really nice handbags uh help us do. We couldn't do it with, without your help. And we're so grateful. Many of you are already buying uh, over the, over the past weeks, uh, a lot of the handbags and Thank you. wow, it's, it's, it's really going to help a, a lot of people. So go on our website, the bag and, uh, and, and, and get a bag. Yeah. And, and be sure to like us on Facebook, um, subscribe to our YouTube channel, share us with others, hashtag us on things that you're doing around the community where you're crushing mm -hmm. that compassion. Right. Uh, put your name in for our, our weekly drawing and just keep showing up with us. We really love you being here. And also, if you know of someone who would be a great interview for our show, would you please let us know? And if you have ideas how we can make, uh, make our show better, uh, all of that, uh, we very much welcome and we very much appreciate. Absolutely. We, we made this show with you in mind. So we're, we're here for you and we love that you're here for us too. Yes. And we have another drawing. Oh, yay. Let's see who's going to win a prize today. Let me, let me get to the bottom of the cup here. Let's see if I can get this out. Oh, Tiffany Fowler of Farmington, New Mexico, Tiffany. my hometown. Tiffany, let's see what you're going what to win. What is Tiffany going to I might, win? I might have an, a sample here. We'll see. The classic tote handbag from the Bog Ladies Collectione. And this is a really popular bag, too. And it's a nice size tote bag, very fashionable. Yeah. Very popular right now. And uh, so anyway, Tiffany, you're going to get this really cool bag. And we're glad you won and glad that you went online. You registered. Doesn't cost anything. And uh, we're just having a lot of fun with our drawings. And we're going to continue having some great prizes. And sometime during the year, we're going to have a grand prize of a safari to Africa oh with boy. the bag ladies. Oh boy. Well, I would like to say that the famous quote of the day is by Pearl S. Buck. And this is, the test of civilization is in the way that it cares for its helpless members. Mm -hmm. And the other day you told me um, there was a lady and she was asked, well, which grandchild do you love the most? Mm -hmm. And what she said was, well, of course, the one who's in the most need at the moment. That's, That's right. the one that I love the most at that point. Um, just showing compassion and love. Yes. for, And we're all there. We have all oh, are down there. and out sometime in our lives. We are. Maybe more than once. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, let's go out there and crush it with compassion for those who are vulnerable, who are helpless, who are marginalized. They need us. 
And you know what? We need, we need them too. And uh, we all need to come together and be enriched by helping each other and finding real purpose in life. And don't forget to buy a bag, help help a cause, change change a a life. life. Thanks a lot. See you next week. Bye.